and turn to John chapter 14. I'm going to try to bring you a few thoughts tonight <clears throat> before we head home that the Lord has given me through, uh, through our Christmas drama and stuff. And I'm playing the part of, of Peter in our, in our drama. And uh, so I was, I was going through and reading some different scripture and going over some different things, and I begin to look at, look at his life and find out, you know, what it is and what it was about him. And you read, and you all know the story about him and how he went to Jesus and said over and over again, Lord, I love you. You know that I love you. You know that I love you. And then we look at how Peter uh, then denies Christ, um, and it's, it's kind of a shameful thing. And it brought the question to my mind myself as I was going through John here and thinking, do I really love Jesus? Do we, do we really love Jesus? And we see the life of Peter and how he was a disciple that was close with Jesus and walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus and was constantly around him. And then we see how, when, it, when the going got tough, how quickly he dropped him. And you, some of my, my lines toward the end talk about, you know, failing Jesus and does real love produce this kind of, of failure and the more and more I thought about that, <clears throat> I begin to go through John and read what the Bible says here. There's, there's some very interesting things here as, as Christians that we can learn from this. So I'll be in John 14, and we'll, we'll jump around a little bit. But John 14, 15, this is a short verse, and then we'll move over to John 18. But this is the, 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 my key verse for tonight. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And flip over to John 18. And read verses 25 through 27. And it says, And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself, and they said there, therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? And he denied it and said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? And Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. And so we see, and we'll, we'll go through some different scripture and read this here. I'll go ahead and go to John 21. It says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he saith unto him, Feed my lambs. And he saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And so I want to ask you tonight, do you really love Jesus? A lot of you probably at your seat are shaking your head and saying, yes, yes, I do love Jesus. And I want to go, go through some stuff tonight that, that hit me as I was going through this, and it hits me on a, on a daily basis. Do I really love Jesus? And you look at different things that, that prove our love toward Jesus. Do, does your life prove that you love Jesus? Do your actions prove that you love Jesus? And are the choices that you make based on your love for Jesus and would others testify your love for Jesus? And that's a, that's a big one to me. I think of that when people look at me, do they think or do they see Jesus? Do they see someone who loves the Lord? And oftentimes going to different funerals and being in the ministry, you have to go to funerals. That's not one of the, the more fun things for, to do when you're in the ministry. But going to different funerals, you'll hear different people get up. And I've been to one of the people who are saved and been to, been to ones of people who, who weren't. And those are the more sad ones because there's not much to be said of their spirituality. There's not much to be said about their love for Christ. And I've heard at some of the other ones, they say, well, man, he, he really loved his wife. And, you know, he really, he really loved, you know, going to the racetrack. And he really loved this and he really loved that and he really loved that. And one in particular, when we were in North Carolina, we had a lady, uh, or, or excuse me, a, a guy that passed away and he wasn't saved. And they did, our, did the funeral at our church. And they got up there and, um, you know, they just talked about everything, this guy. And I sat there thinking, that guy didn't love Jesus. He, he didn't know Jesus. He didn't know who he was. 
And our lives are, are such a short time, and people see us and watch us on a daily basis. And do your actions show that you love Jesus? And I, I don't ever want it to be said of me when I die one day that, man, he loved to hunt, and he loved to this, and he loved to, you know, play softball, and he loved to do this. I want it to be Tyler Chandler loved Jesus. Tyler Chandler loved Jesus with all of his heart. And he did whatever he could to try to tell others about Jesus and to lead people and to show people who Jesus was. And so I want to look at some things tonight. If you'll follow along with me, I'll try to be very, very brief. But what does the Lord have to say about your love for him? All throughout God's word, he confronts his people and addresses their inconsistent actions toward him. In Malachi 1.6, it says, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you. O priest that despise my name, and ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? You think of, of stuff, and I want you to examine your life as, as we go through tonight. You think of your relationship with Jesus Christ. You think of your day-to-day -day walk with Jesus and how it is, and you, you, you examine your own life tonight. I don't think about anybody, anybody else tonight but yourself. You examine your life. And you say, am I devoted to Jesus Christ as I am my job? Am I devoted to Jesus Christ as I am my, my relationship with my wife? Am I as devoted to Jesus Christ as I am as paying my bills on time and, and doing, doing these things? Am I devoted to Jesus as I am with everything else that I am so devoted in in life? And sad, a lot of times we look at our life and, and we're not. It's sad that a lot of times we examine ourselves and it takes a, a, a consequence or some kind of circumstance to come into our life to, to get us back on track. And I want to tell you tonight that in, in, in our day-to-day -day walk, we ought to love Jesus more than anything that this world has to offer. We ought to see our lives and examine our lives and say, do I really love Jesus? And when people come up to you, it's more than just wearing a little sticker on your shirt that says, I love Jesus. It's more, it's more than just coming to church. It's more than just coming to Sunday school. It's more than just being in a play. It's more than any of those things. Your life, it, it, it all revolves around loving Jesus. That's, all, that's how it ought to be. When people look at you, they ought to say, man, there's something different about them. Yeah, they might be a little weird, but that's not what they should see. They should say, there, there's something about them that's different. There's something about them that's different. I tell our teenagers all the time, in order to make a difference, you have to be different. Don't be a weirdo. Just be different. Be different. And live a life that is that is so known by those that are around you that they can see Jesus and they say to you, there's something different about them. Don't know what it is, but there's something different. We, we jump down in Mark 14, 29 and 30. It says, but Peter said unto him, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus saith unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me. So as I'm going through and reading this stuff about Peter, Peter was a very confident guy. Uh, he, he said, there's no way in the world I'll ever deny Christ, and said it over and over and over again. And we see all this scripture that says, and Peter said unto him, although all shall be offended, although everybody in this whole entire world, everybody that's around me shall be offended, not I, Christ, not me. And then we see later on in scripture that the cock doesn't even crow three times before he's already denying him, denying him, denying him. And we jump down and all this kind of stuff, and I want you to consider these things for a little while Understanding this, Jesus will not be persuaded by just your words. Jesus will not be persuaded by just the things that you, you say. He can see directly into your heart. And Jesus' own disciples who prophesied in his name and who were with him did not, did not truly hear. We see that they, they didn't have this love for Jesus. And we see that they scattered and they went away. And Peter professed with his mouth and said these things. And said that I'll, never live, that I'll never leave Jesus and that I love him and I'm there. And then we see what he does. A lot of times we think that we can fool Jesus. And we can't. We can't, fool, we can't fool the one who made us. We can fool our friends. We can fool our family. We can fool our co-workers. Co uh, you might even be able to fool yourself. But you can't fool Jesus. Why? Because he knows your heart. He knows your heart. We can come to church and say things and get up and sing all the songs we want to, sing from page one in the hymn book all the way to the end. You can get up here and put on a big show, but just because you sing songs and just because you come to church doesn't mean that you love Jesus. Doesn't mean those things. And so we have to examine our lives, and we have to, to see this. Do you really love Jesus? I'm going to say that a lot tonight, so get used to it. First thing, if you're taking down notes here, if you love Jesus, you'll be obedient you'll be obedient. 
In John 14, 15, we read that verse that says, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love, if you love me, keep my commandments. You read the first part of that verse, and it begins with a statement, if. Why? Because Jesus knew that everybody that he was addressing at that time didn't love him. And one of his own disciples is preparing to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. And if you really do truly love Jesus, there will be evidence in your life. Jesus makes it very clear what the evidence of love uh, for him will be, and that's obedience. Uh, you parents in here that have, that have kids and, and you, you ask them to do something and they, and they don't do it, how does that make you feel? You can talk to me back, talk to me back. Disrespecting. You don't, you don't, you, it, it makes you upset. You, you don't like that growing up. You don't, you don't, you don't like that. You don't like uh, when you're telling your kids something and they, and they don't do it and you tell them again and again and again. And my parents told me this, and they have actually quoted this scripture to me, saying, if you love me, you will obey me. You will do what it is that I say. Why? Because that obedience, you, you do the things for Christ, you obey Christ because you love him, you obey your parents because you love them. And just that same way, if you, if you love Jesus, you will be obedient. 1 John 2, 3-5 through 5 says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And he that saith, I know him. And keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Verse 4 of that is very, very convicting. He saith, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. Now, we use the word liar today in our word very flippantly. Uh, We'll say, you know, somebody's joking around. Oh, you liar. You know, saying that very flippantly, flippantly. But in the Bible... Calling someone a liar was a really, really, really big deal. Um, calling someone a liar was, was, a, was a huge deal. And so when it says, And keepeth not his commandments as a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that are in, in him. So here John reveals that if you're not obedient, your heart's not right. I remember being upset or upset at my parents, you know, growing up, and them telling me, you know, go pick up trash or go rake leaves or whatever it was to do. And they'd say, go do that. And I'd be like, man, I ain't going to rate no leaves. I don't want to do that. I want to stay there, play PlayStation, whatever was out there. I, want to, I don't want to do that. And my mom would call and call again and call again. And then finally you hear dad walking up the steps. And it's like, okay, I got to get going. And I remember having this talk with my dad. And I know I use this, these different illustrations with him a lot because I had a lot of conversations with my dad. I wasn't the perfect kid. I know that's hard to believe for you. But uh, he said, listen, when mom tells you to do something, you got to do it. And he gave me this whole example of, you know, your mother loves you, and she cooks for you and cleans your clothes, and she does this, and she lets you breathe air and all this kind of stuff. And, and I said, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And he said, if you love your mom, you'll obey her. If you love your mom, if you, if you be obedient to your mom, that'll show you, that'll show her that you, that you love her. And so here we see that there's, there is an obedience to the Lord and the heart of those that, that truly love the Lord. Anyone can say they love God, but the proof is in obeying God. I can say that I, that I love, you know, love my parents and all this, but whenever they tell me to do something, I'm not going to do it. You would, see that, you would see that that doesn't make much sense. But in the obedience in this part of Scripture, we see that obedience is a big thing. So if the evidence of our love for Jesus is obedient, then we have to examine our lives to see if we measure up to the second thing, and that's the evaluation in Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40, it says, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so in Matthew 22, we read that Jesus here has silenced the Sadducees and the Pharisees came to the question, or to question him again, and one of the experts in religious law asked him this question, trying to trap him. And he said these things. He said, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus sums up the entire law in these verses. Notice what he says here in verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so if you want to know if you really love Jesus... Uh, then you must measure up your life and actions against this verse. You say you love Jesus. You say that you love Jesus and you, and you are here and you are sold out and you say these things. But Jesus says, if you love me, 
you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And many will proclaim that God is first, and God's number one, and we have number one God, and we carry around the big foam finger that says number one, it says God on it, we shake it around, and everybody sees it. But then we place everything else, everyone else, all above Jesus Christ. Everything that happens, we, we put it all above Jesus, and it's, it's a big deal. And if we truly love the Lord, he will have prominence in every area of our life. The great commandment sums up the Ten Commandments. You look at the first four of the top ten. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make uh, for yourself any graven image. Uh, you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And if we love the Lord with all our heart and with all our soul and with all of our strength, then we won't have any other gods before him. We won't create any idols, whatever they may be. We won't take his name in vain. We will remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And so you say you love God. I'm going to ask you this question. You say you love God, but do you talk to him? You say you love God, but do you talk to him? I say to my wife that I love her, and I, and I do all the time. Every, every morning before I leave, I say I love you. I text her during the day and I'm telling her I love her. Because of that, communication with her, I, 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 have, I have this a relationship. I talk to her regularly. If I said that I loved her and just, you know, sat around the house, never saw her, never did anything with her, uh, never, never said anything, she would might question if I, if I really loved her. And I'm sure that if the only time that I ever talked to her when I was at home was complaining about something that she'd done or complaining about this or complaining about that or always negative, she, she probably wouldn't really think that I loved her. She probably would have questions and doubts in her mind if I, if I really loved her. I'm sure the only time that I talked to her when I was asking her to do something for me, she might question if I, if I really loved her. And you, you would say at your seat, yeah, why would you do that? You're a doorknob. Why would you, why would you do that? You'd never do that with your, to your wife. But it's sad that we do that with Jesus. It's sad that the only time we go to him is when we're complaining about something. It's sad that the only time we go to him is when we, when we want something. It's sad that the only time when we pray and, and communicate with God is when we, we need to get out of a quick jam and we've got ourselves into a situation that we can't get out of. And hey, we, I find myself doing that all the time. I find myself doing that all the time. Funny story, I was uh, driving late down, down the road. I was going to laugh when I say this. We were, we were driving down the road late one night and uh, I was so tired, and I was trying to get home, and, and uh, that's no excuse to speed, but, but I was tired. And um, coming down the road, and the speed limit was like 65, and I was probably going like 85, trying to get home. And uh, the speed limit switches very quick to, to 25 on this road, like instant quick. And I was driving, trying to get there home, and, and I was flying through there. And there was a police officer sitting right at this sign, right on the edge of that road. And uh, I saw him, and he saw me, and immediately I, <laughs> I called out to the Lord. I said, God, if you love me right now, <laughs> if there's ever a time where I've needed you, it is right now. Because I'm going to jail if I get pulled over. And, and I said this, I said, as one of your children, please, dear Heavenly Father, do not let that cop turn around. I beg of you. I was, I was seriously pleading to God. I really was. This is the truth. He was laughing, cracking me up. So I was, I was going down this road, and I was just, I was calling out to God, Lord, please do not let me get a ticket. And for, I don't know if the Lord gave that guy a flat tire. I don't know if he was sleeping, eating the donut. I don't know what. But he did not turn around, and I was very thankful. We laugh at that now. And I was very thankful. But it seems like the only time that we need God a lot of times is when we're in trouble. And we call God and we say, God, please get me out of the situation. Please, God, I don't want to do this or whatever it may be. And the only time that, that we talk to him is when we need something. And just as today, as you wouldn't do that with an earthly relationship, you, wouldn't, you, you would communicate with those that are around you. We shouldn't do that with God. Or we, we should have a, a daily communication time with God, praying, asking him to, to help us and talking to him and communing with him. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, it says, In everything give thanks, 
For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Sometimes we just need to get alone with God and thank him for who he is. Thank him for his mercy and his grace and his love and his kindness. And having that communion with God, there's nothing sweeter than than those things. And if you really love God, if you really love him, you'll communicate with him. You'll talk to him. Number two, you say you love God, but do you allow him to speak to you? I was doing some different, going over some different studies and some different um, things that were going on. And it said that 60% of professing Christians in America don't read the Bible. Another article states, Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't read it. And because they don't read it, they have become a nation of biblical illiterates. There are some who would argue over which translation of the Bible to use, and they'll argue till they're blue in the face, argue and argue and argue about this and that, that don't even pick up a Bible themselves. And they'll argue, and they'll say this, and they'll say that, and they don't even read it themselves. And the Bible is God's infallible, inerrant, inspired, holy word of God. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, 105, that word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. And while prayer is our way of speaking to God, the Bible is God's way of speaking to us. And so it's very important that we are spending time in the word of God, that we're praying, that we're reading the Bible, that we're allowing God to speak to us as we talk back to him. And too many folks, too many people that are in our world are having one-way conversations. One-way conversations. God's given us the Bible. We have so many ways of reading the Bible on our smartphones, on our tablets, on the computer. Any way you want it, you can get the Bible. And yet this this percentage of people says that 67% of Americans don't even, even read their Bible. You know what's sad to me? Is when I go out in the parking lot or when I, you know, see somebody's Bible, you know, sitting back here and it sat back here, you know, for the whole year and a half that I've been here. And I, I go through and I'll see Bibles all over the place. And I'll say, man, I <laughs> guess they're not reading theirs. Hope they have an extra copy at home or, you know, whatever. I'll see Bibles in, in windshields of people's cars that are all rolled up and the leather's all ruined. And I, and I see that I'm saying, man... It's one thing to have it and let everybody see it, but it's another thing to read it. And while God says, listen, I want you to talk to me, but I also want to be able to talk to you. You say, I love my Bible. We sing the B-I-B-L-E. We've been singing it since we were in Sunday school. And that's God's way of speaking to us. But do you really love God? Do you really love your Bible? Did you read as many verses of the Bible this week as you did news headlines? Did you spend more time studying God's word than you did scrolling through your Twitter or your Facebook or your Instagram this week? Did you see what was going on in the world or did you use more electricity this week at the lamp where you study or did your television set use more electricity than that? And hey, I'm calling out myself on this. I'm calling out myself because it's, it, it's, how, it's how it's supposed to be. We look and say this thing, well, we'll do all this stuff, but we'll spend more time doing all these other things that don't matter a hill of beans than we do reading the Bible. God's word is a living word. We need to allow God to speak to us in these ways. It's a blessing and a privilege. I remember the video that pastor showed during missions of those people opening the case of Bibles and weeping, weeping and kissing the Bible and and holding it like we would, you know, our our cars or our tablets or whatever we may have. People holding these Bibles and weeping, crying that they have a Bible to read. And we have so many ways, and yet we can't hardly crack it during the week. Another study that I saw said Christians, 65% of Christians uh, don't worship anywhere. And that made me think to this this third one. You say you love God, but do you come to his house? And many of you obviously are here. Hebrews 10.25, you all know the verse says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So I was reading this statistic, and it said 65% of people don't even worship anywhere. We have such an awesome privilege to come and be around like-minded believers and worship and pray and study and fellowship. So many take that privilege for granted. There well may be a day that comes soon, I don't know, where we, we don't have the freedom to no longer come here. We don't have the privilege to, to come here. You never know what may happen. And as, as, a, as one who's given their life to, to, to do the work of God and the ministry and Pastor Tony and Pastor Dave and Pastor Joe. and we, we spend this time 
you know, studying out these scriptures and you spend hours upon hours digging into the word of God. I'm not saying this to boast us up. But I'm saying we, we get in our offices and we study and do these things, prepare a message to, to share to a, a group of people having a God-given burden to reach someone. And then people that are supposedly active members just don't come because there's something better to do. I'll tell you what, it's discouraging sometimes. You get into your Sunday school class and ask some of these Sunday school teachers, hey, I wasn't there last week, you know, I decided to sleep in, whatever it was, and that guy thinks to himself, man, I spent nine hours to share a word of God with you. I want to tell you something, God's word's important. Reading the Bible's important, praying's important, coming to the house of God is important. These are things that we need to make important. These are things that we need to take in our lives and say, man, somebody, somebody's spending time, somebody's spending time in this Bible, somebody's staying up late studying the scripture for me, to share with me, to help me, to give me what God, to give, uh, me what God wants for me, you look at that and we hear people say all this kind of stuff. Well, the whole world's falling to pieces and, and you see the news and you see this and you see that. And I want to say, what are you doing to change it? What are you doing to change the world? We can sit there and listen to the radio and listen to Rush Limbaugh and whatever you want to talk about, hearing everybody say how bad the world is and how bad President Obama is and all this kind of stuff. But what are you doing to change it? We can sit there and talk about all these things and say like a broken record over and over and over again. And I want to ask you, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you opening your Bible? Are you praying? Are you coming to church? Are you involved? Are you doing things that, that would help make a difference? We have a lot of people, uh, funny thing, we have a lot of chiefs, but not a lot of Indians. A lot of chiefs and not a lot of Indians. We need to have more people that are more caring about the word of God and what it says and what God has given us and sharing that with other people. And talking about the things that's not going on. What can you do to change it? Are you praying? Are you asking God to give you courage to speak? There are people willing and prepared to teach your children in children's church every week, but don't have the opportunity because you decided not to go this morning, or you had the urge to do something else on this Sunday. But you say you love Jesus. You say you love Jesus, but if you love Jesus, will you keep his commandments? You say you love God, lastly, But do you give him what is his? Malachi 3, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet he have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? And we say, How can we rob God? We must consider the fact that what belongs to him. And God is gracious enough to allow us to keep the majority of what we are blessed with. And he only asks for a small portion in return. And God says that they robbed him in tithes and offerings. I always find this funny, and it put me in perspective uh, a few months ago. You go to a store, and I always get ticked off. Stores that say, big sale, blowout sale. You walk in there, and it's like, you know, 10% off. It's like 10%. 10%. Are you kidding me? I want like 50%, 75%. That's what I want off off an item. I go into a store, Black Friday's coming around. We're going to go hog wild, go buy everything, spend all the money we got, go broke, not eat for weeks. We'll do all these things. <laughs> and you walk into a store and 10% off. You know what I do when I see a 10% off sign? <laughs> Going the other way. That's a waste of my time. But when God says, hey, let's give 10% of our, our, our tithes and offerings to him, we're like, good Lord, what am I supposed to do? I ain't going to be able to eat. My kids are going to starve. We freak out over 10%. We freak out. Yet when there's a, something that's on sale as 10%, we're like, what's the big deal? No big deal. I ain't doing that. I ain't do, that's stupid. That's not enough. And we look at that and we say, man, there's a, there's a, dra- there's a very, very big contrast there. 10% is not a lot. If I save 10%, I could care less. It's not a big deal. But when it comes to giving God what is his, he says, I want you to give me 10%. And it's like, whoa, let's hold off on that. God, don't you think it's a little too much? I mean, I got to go get, you know, this. I got to go get that. Whatever it may be. The problem is with our, with our attitudes toward giving to God is to simply give him what is left. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't mind leftovers. I like leftovers. As you can tell, I can eat a pretty good amount. But there's nothing like when my wife makes barbecue chicken and potato casserole and baked beans and sweet rolls and sweet tea and getting it first. I'm the first one. At my house, I'm the first one. I get to eat. My dog doesn't get anything. He gets dog food. I'm the first one. I get the, I get the top. I get the best that, that, that there is. And I'm there. I don't mind eating the next day. It's good the next day. It's great even the next day. And the next day, I don't need that far. Just a couple days. 
But there's nothing like when it first comes out of the oven. It's good. Leftovers are okay. But sometimes as they go through, it's like, oh, leftovers, don't know, let's just go out to eat. Let's forget the leftovers. But a lot of times we'll just give God what's left over of our money, our time. And are you wasting your time giving God what is left? We can spend $200 on things that we don't need on any given Saturday and put a $20 bill on the plate on Sunday. We might need to examine our priorities. We might need to examine the things that we have. You might be able to say, I can't afford to give. You can't afford not to. I can't afford to give. I can't afford to go to the church and spend three hours, you know, at play practice. I can't afford to do this. I ain't got time to do this. Listen, you can't afford not to. You have to give God what is his. He doesn't ask for much. He doesn't ask for much. We think of the time and the different things that we are doing. We can't afford not to give God what is his. Say, I love Jesus. I love God. I got the sticker to prove it. 35 years, Sunday school captain right here. You love Jesus, but do you keep his commandments? I love Jesus, but am I keeping his commandments? You say you love God, but do you serve him? Romans 12, 4, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that God has given us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, is he, uh, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. If, you, if God has given you leadership ability, take responsibility seriously. If you have a gift for showing kindness, do it to others gladly. Can you be a leader? Can you be an encourager? Can you serve in any capacity? If you have the ability to do any of these things, it is because God, through his grace, gave you that ability. Why did he give you that ability? So that you can use it for the glory and honor of his name. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for as the body is one and many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body also in Christ. My favorite songs from a long time ago says, if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? If we are the body, why aren't his feet going? I think if we are the body, we're supposed to be doing these things. We're supposed to be going out. We're supposed to be reaching. We're supposed to be reaching his hands out to heal. We're supposed to be teaching his words. We're supposed to be going if we are the body. In our scripture that we've read tonight, there's many excuses, many different things that we probably have thought about, many different things that come to our mind. And it, it's going to be sad and one day when we get to heaven and God says to us, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you go here? I was putting in your heart to go here and do this and to witness to this person and say, well, God, basketball was more important to me at that time. Or go and watch the Buckeyes play. I know it's a sensitive topic. Go and watch the Buckeyes play. It was way more important to me at that time. I'm going to stand before Almighty God one day and say these things. Well, God, you know that it was the last football game of the season. You know that I couldn't, couldn't go to that. You know that I couldn't go to church on Super Bowl Sunday. I, could, I had to be watching the game. You know, God. One day we're going to get there, and I think we're going to be very embarrassed by our responses to, to what we're going to have to say. We're going to see people that God might have put our way, or things might go on, and all we're going to have is excuses. If we love Jesus, you'll keep my commandments. I can't answer that question for you, but you can. And we've looked at God's word, and we've talked about Peter, and Jesus won't be fooled by your words. He can see your heart. Maybe he's revealed something to you through scripture tonight. He's revealed to you in, in, in your heart that there's things, your priorities are out of whack. Things that, that you need to get right. There's things that, that you need to do. I want to encourage you. Don't, don't waste time. Don't waste time doing things that don't matter. Don't waste time. I was sitting here listening to the, the part of the play where we're doing the hell scene thinking, all these different things that we waste our time and waste our time and waste our time doing and not, not following what God says. And we say that we love God. We say that we love God. We say that we love him. And we come to church Sunday morning and we come to church Sunday night and we come to church Wednesday night and we teach Sunday school and we're in Sunday school and we come to everything. You say that you love God. Are you keeping his commandments? Are you doing what he's saying? Are you following God full out, sold out, wholeheartedly to Jesus Christ? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and I'll be done. I just want to pray 
for you tonight for, for anything that might be hindering your walk with Christ right now. There's many things that come into our life, and I understand people are busy. I understand that. I understand that there's things that come up. I do understand that. But I, I want you to understand that one day we're going to have to give an account for our life and the things that we do and the things that we've said and the places that we've gone and our attitudes, the way that we've done certain things. And I want to do more than just give God some lip service. I want, I want, I want to do more than just giving God my leftovers. I want to do more than just giving God my second best. I want when you guys look at me to say he loves Jesus Christ. I want to be able to look at you and say that person is sold out to Jesus Christ. They love Jesus. They love the Lord. They are here all the time with a smile on their face. Every time we have something, they are here loving Jesus, loving people. And I, I don't know about you, but that's how I want to be. I want to be known as someone who is sold out to Jesus Christ.